Greetings and welcome everyone to Golden Cross, uh, Artifacts of Spanish Imperialism in the Western Hemisphere. It's wonderful to be with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us for this program today. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we hope that you are all staying well uh, during the pandemic and we are grateful for your participation in this Rosenbach event. Uh, Emily, if you would advance slides, please. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give you a quick sense of what we're going to be doing together today. During today's tour, we're going to be looking at some fascinating and comparatively little known artifacts from the collections of the Rosenbach relating to the history of Mexico um, using the lens of post-colonial theory. Uh, we'll spend approximately an hour together today, maybe less, depending on how many questions we have and how much discussion we have at the end of the presentation but it's, uh, we'll probably be together for between 40 minutes and an hour, and we'll have, we have several different uh, tasks and goals to accomplish. First, I want to provide an introduction to the Rosenbach for those of you who are perhaps joining us for the first time in our program today, uh, and specifically offer an introduction to the different panelists who you see on your screen at the moment. One of the great things about this program in particular is that we have a variety of, um, members of our, of our team who are going to be contributing to today's program. Um, we wanna share a bit about the program philosophy that guided our construction of this particular tour. Uh, I'll talk a bit about post-colonial theory and how we're going to be using that uh, in our tour today, look at some artifacts from the Rosenbach's collection uh, and provide you with some other resources, digital resources, so that you can continue exploring these topics from home after our presentation is over. Finally, we will have time for Q&A and discussion at the end of the program. If you do have any questions or comments that come up during the program, please do feel free to enter them in the chat box and we'll keep track of uh, those and be able to address them when we get to the end of the program. Next slide, please. So for those of you who um, perhaps have not visited the Rosenbach in person before, or for whom this may be your first virtual program, I just want to give you a little bit of context for our institution. I think it'll help you um, understand more about the collections objects that we look at shortly. So just really briefly, the Rosenbach is an historic house museum and special collections library near Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia on Delancey Place with core strengths in several areas. Uh, namely American history, British and continental European literature, uh, and fine and decorative art. We're a unique institution in that we have remarkable holdings in both museum artifacts as well as library materials. We offer a wide variety of events, programs, and exhibitions. You can learn more at rosenbach.org. And the project today that we're really presenting on it is sort of unique, and I want to just take a moment to tell you about the origins of this uh, program, Golden Cross, uh, to help you understand how we ended up as a team coming together to prepare this program. Uh, we're joined today by two graduate interns who have been helping me, helping Emily and others um, really delve into our Spanish language holdings at the Rosenbach, largely connected to the history of Mexico. Uh, our project started as a cataloging project and has grown into a, a number of different public interpretation efforts uh, in terms of on-site tours relating to our Mexican history holdings. And this is our first ever digital program uh, related to this work, this sort of discovery work, this research project that we all engaged on together. So what you are seeing today and what we will be engaging in is a discussion that really is a reporting out on some of the initial um, progress we've made in better understanding aspects of our Mexican history holdings. As I mentioned earlier, we have a whole panel of uh, Rosenbach uh, staff and affiliates here with you today. Our moderator is Director of Education, Emily Parker, who has very kindly agreed to sort of manage our tech for us and also keep her eye on the chat box. Uh, she'll be moderating the Q&A uh, at the end, as well as our discussion session. And we have three presenters today who will be sharing the sort of core content that we want to deliver today. This is a special program and that we are welcoming our graduate interns who have really done the lion's share of the work uh, to 
present their findings to you. And it's truly an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to introduce them to you. We are joined by Aya Kingsbury, who is currently pursuing her MA in Latin American Studies at the University of Delaware. She holds a BA in History from Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania and came to the Rosenbach um, last summer after, uh, to begin this project after having spent a year teaching English in Ecuador. Her research interests focus on 20th century American history in an international military context and her professional interests uh, include increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in museum and public humanities environments. Aya sits on the Rosenbach's Diversity, Equity, Access, and Inclusion Committee. So thank you, Aya, for joining us today. Uh, our other graduate intern, Scott Long, is a doctoral candidate in Hispanic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He holds bachelor's degrees in Spanish and Classics from Bates College, studied at the University of Chile in Santiago, completed a master's degree in Medieval Studies at Fordham University, and holds a post bac certificate in Latin and an MA in Hispanic Studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Scott has significant background in paleography or the study of historic handwriting, which for reasons that will become apparent later in our program has proven very useful uh, in our work together at the Rosenbach. Scott also sits on the Rosenbach's Diversity, Equity, Access, and Inclusion uh, Committee. So many thanks to Emily, A. and Scott for participating in this event today. I will also introduce myself. My name is Alex Ames. I work as Collections Engagement Manager at the Rosenbach meaning I'm deeply involved with my colleagues in the collections department in the basic tasks of preserving and stewarding our vast collection. And I uh, have the opportunity to work on programs like this that help um, make our holdings ac accessible to the public. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. The Rosenbach is really thrilled uh, during this time of physical distancing uh, during the pandemic to be able to bring you virtual programs like this um, free, of, free of charge. Uh, however, these programs are not free for us to produce, both in terms of the uh, expenses we incur in creating digital programs and the time that our staff put into these efforts. So if you are able, I would like to ask that you please consider making a donation of any size uh, to the Rosenbach so that we may continue to build new communities of historians from around the world. You will see the URL at the top of your, of your screen. Um, if you, you are under no obligation, but if you are able to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it. Next slide, please. I want to say a word before we delve into our content about the philosophy that has really shaped how we assembled this program and you know, really, I would go so far as to say how we have uh, pursued this broader project of understanding our holdings connected to the history of Mexico with the Rosenbach. Today's presenters believe that the only way to build a more understanding and equitable future is to explore the historical roots of the modern political, cultural, social, and economic systems that shape our world. We use historical artifacts like rare books and manuscripts uh, to explore these topics, uh, including uncomfortable topics, to start conversations that we hope can uh, really inform our civic discourse, uh, especially from an historical perspective. Our goal today is to share some of our holdings with you uh, in the hope that uh, this will only be the beginning of your exploration of the topics that we touch on today. We very much bring a sort of librarian's mentality to this work in the sense that we don't necessarily have all the answers, but we do want to um, help you think through some of these issues and how to learn more about them. If you're interested in learning more about the Rosenbach's commitment to equity, uh, you'll see a URL that I think Emily has entered in the, into the chat box as well, uh, where you can read more about the work that we're doing in this important area. Next slide, please. That leads perfectly into uh, a land acknowledgement you know, our content focus today is on Spanish colonialism in the Western Hemisphere, uh, touching on topics including indigenous issues. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge, we want to acknowledge that the land on which the Rosenbach sits is the ancestral land of the Lenape people, whose presence, resilience, and contributions to Philadelphia and Pennsylvania continue to this day 
With this program, we truly seek to honor the original caretakers of this land and the entire North American continent, recognize the histories of land theft, violence, erasure, and oppression that have brought us and so many other cultural heritage institutions here, and use historical analysis, as we discussed earlier, to strive toward a more inclusive future. Next slide, please. So this uh, brings us again to an important topic, um, which is post-colonial theory. And this is really a uh, tool, a theoretical tool that we um, used in, in thinking through the content that we are sharing with you today and that we um, would, would like just to share a little bit more about as we establish the context for the uh, rest of our presentation. A history professor of mine from back when I was a graduate student at the University of Delaware made a point some years ago that still resonates with me. He said that the study of history is not so much about finding answers in historical sources as it is about asking the right questions of primary sources. Of course, the questions that we ask of uh, historic documents, historic books, and artifacts really determines the answers that we find inside those materials. This is useful to bear in mind as we look at a set of objects from the Rosenbach's collection today that offer windows into the Spanish Empire's presence in the Western Hemisphere uh, in the early modern period. We can interpret artifacts in different ways based on the lens that we use to study those artifacts. Today, we want to explore how post-colonial theory can be applied to books and manuscripts that easily can simply be seen as sort of relics of um, elite Spanish culture. Uh, how do we read between the lines with these artifacts to unlock different stories about history? And how can we do that work together? So here you have a quote, a definition of post-colonial theory uh, from, from Professor J. Daniel Elam uh, from the University of Hong Kong. And I'm just going to read it to you. It's a nice summation of the topic. Post-colonial theory is a body of thought primarily concerned with accounting for the political, aesthetic, economic, historical, and social impact of European colonial rule around the world in the 18th through the 20th century. Post-colonial theory takes many different shapes and interventions, but all share a fundamental claim that the world we inhabit is impossible to understand, except in relationship to the history of imperialism and the history of colonial rule. Uh, I, well, one thing that I would note about this definition is, of course, we're not really talking just from the 18th century, the 1700s through the 20th century, when we're talking about Spanish uh, colonial presence uh, in the Western Hemisphere, we're actually talking much earlier than that. Next slide, please. Um, could you go back one slide, Emily? Thank you. So the I wanted to just linger a little bit more <clears throat> on this idea of why would we why would we use post-colonial theory and here you have a quote from another source one of the leading scholars of this topic who says that the value of post-colonial theory is that it allows us and encourages us to think about how we can reconstruct western knowledge formations reorient ethical norms turn the power structures of the world upside down and refashion the world from below the idea being that we need to look beyond elite European culture better to understand um, how the world that we know today came in, into existence. The post-colonial has always been concerned with interrogating the interrelated histories of violence, domination, inequality, and injustice, with addressing the fact that, and the re reasons why, millions of people in the world still live without things that most of those in the West take for granted. Next slide, please. So to that point, uh, thinking about telling different stories with artifacts of Spanish imperialism helps us think beyond traditional understandings of what counts as European philosophy, European literature, or European history. Uh, we can only understand the history of Europe and the history of European presence in the Western Hemisphere if we understand complex cultural interactions that shaped these experiences. Next slide. So what are some of the questions that we can ask of sources if we want to understand them in new and different ways? Well, here are just a few examples uh, of questions that one can ask of historical source material. And these are questions that we're going to explore in greater depth as we delve into 
some of the objects from the Rosenbach collection. How did European, African, and indigenous interactions change the worlds of African and indigenous peoples? And to put it in another way, to sort of take a mirror to that, how did African and indigenous, Ameri indigenous American peoples change European society? What consequences did European imperialism hold for the natural world? There's one object that we're going to study that really d dives into that topic in an interesting way. And most, perhaps most broadly, how do we reinterpret traditional source materials to tell different stories? I want to make a note that one way that we at the Rosenbach are trying to do this work of thinking in new ways about these materials is to actually interpret them in the Spanish language. So uh, when we do reopen to the public uh, at some unknown point in the future and get back to offering our regular tours again, I do invite you to check out our Mexico race and revolution in the borderland behind the bookcase hands-on tour, which is offered bilingually in Spanish and English. Uh, and is an opportunity to further engage with these topics and with some of our materials in a more hands-on format. Next slide, please. Before I turn the floor over to Aya and Scott to shed more light on some particular objects from the Rosenbach collection, I just wanna give a really um, thumbnail sketch of some key themes in, in the history of Mexico. This is by no, by no means comprehensive, and I am not expert in this field myself, but I think before looking at specific artifacts, it's useful just to have a little bit of context uh, for the sort of the time period that the materials we are going to be studying uh, were made. Prior to the Spanish conquest of Mexico, there were at least four distinct civilizations that thrived there, uh, the Olmecs, the Mayans, the Toltecs, and the Aztecs. At its peak, it is believed that the Aztec empire comprised five million people. Um, the history of Mexico changed dramatically with the arrival of the well-known conquistador Cortes in Mexico in 1519, which marked the beginning of several centuries of Spanish imperial rule over Mexico. What emerged in this time was a complex and intertwined set of political and economic systems uh, it, that enriched the Spanish empire. Uh, by, with the extraction of mineral wealth and other natural resources using enslaved indigenous and African labor in an economic system known as mercantilism, in which um, wealth was sort of the theory of mercantilism being that wealth should remain within one imperial context. Uh, so the, the riches of uh, the, the overseas empire should remain within, the Span within Spanish control. What ended up emerging because of these interconnected cultural, political, and economic realities uh, and labor systems was a complex racial and ethnic hierarchy, the uh, impact of which is still felt uh, to this very day. Spanish imperial rule uh, came to an end in uh, Mexico in the early years of the 1800s uh, in, in an era of revolutions in Latin America. Uh, one of the things that you are going to note today as we continue our conversation is that we're really going to explore how all of these different domains, politics, economy, and religion, uh, intersect in key ways. Emily, next slide, please. You know, I want to just really quickly share with you two, ter two terms that I'm using somewhat interchangeably, imperialism and colonialism. Uh, the term imperialism, in, with its most strict definition, really um, dates from the end of the 19th century and at its minimal sort of uh, connotation is the use of state power to secure economic monopolies uh, for national companies. Uh, colonialism is a bigger enterprise and involves um, extranational sort of conquest and, and so on. Uh, this is an important distinction. I did want to note that um, these two, two terms that we're using in terms of the Spanish empire and post-colonial theory uh, are connected, but not exactly the same. Next slide. The provenance of the documents uh, that we are going to look at today deserves note. It would, it's a natural question, sort of how did the Rosenbach get the manuscripts that we're going to study? And I can tell you really quickly a bit about that. So the documents, uh, that we're going to study, uh, for the most part, came from two different um, collections. One, interestingly enough, was a collection uh, that Dr. Rose, materials that Dr. Rosenbach acquired 
from uh, an Italian nobleman in the early years of the 1900s who was actually a di the direct descendant and heir of Cortez. This Italian nobleman had fallen on hard times uh, as, and this was sort of Dr. Rosenbach's Ballywick was who, purchasing uh, materials from European aristocrats who needed to shore up their finances. So Dr. Rosenbach ended up purchasing this material about Mexican history, not from Mexico, but from a, um, an, an Italian aristocratic family. Some of the other material in our collection at the Rosenbach came from the collection of a well-known co um, collector of Mexican history materials named Henry Ward Poole. We actually have a finding aid uh, online that sheds more light on the provenance questions, which we will share with you via email after the program is concluded. Next slide, please. So with that, I am going to turn the floor over to our graduate interns, Scott and Aya, who are going to now really hone their focus onto some of the um, important artifacts that we have at the Rosenbach. Uh, that connect to themes in Mexican history. Thanks, Alex, uh, for that very nice introduction and that, that great overview of, of how we're framing uh, these artifacts. Um, this is really one of the most fascinating things uh, in the whole collection, um, I think, or at least in this series. Um, this is a document from the King of Spain, Charles V, to Hernán Cortés. So, two of the most huge figures in the conquest and colonization of Mexico. Um, and as you can see in the notes here, it's signed, Yo el Rey, I the King. Um, and that makes this document um, official, uh, so to speak. Um, it would have borne the, the seal of the monarchy. Uh, so Charles V was at the same time the, the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain. So he was a, uh, probably one of the most important political military figures of, of the 16th century, most responsible for the colonization of the new world. And you know, a little bit more about the, the materiality of this document, it is a manuscript, right? And um, we're in the 16th century, so print is, is well underway, but print just served to make handwriting, manuscript writing, all the more prestigious and important. Um, and that is why this, this title of nobility, that's what it is, is written by the scribes of Charles V. And um, as a title of nobility, it's granting um, the title of Marquez del Valle de Oaxaca, so Marquez of the Valley of Oaxaca, to Cortes. Um, as basically compensation for his conquest of New Spain, of Nueva España, which is the name that the Spanish gave to Mexico, um, you know, which just tells us what an important colony it was that they called it New Spain. And this was the personal copy of Hernán Cortés. Um, so you can see materially, um, politically, uh, almost spiritually, this is a, a huge document because it's taking this medieval worldview where kings give titles to nobles in exchange for their military service and taking this medieval worldview and bringing it over to the new world, um, to the former Aztec lands. All right, and with that, I think we can go on to the next slide. Okay, and here's a, another manuscript in just like the previous one, from Charles V to Hernán Cortés. And not only is it also a document from Charles V to Hernán Cortés, it was actually written and signed on the same day as the previous document. And so this one is not a title of nobility, it's actually a land grant. So granting lands in Lake um, Ecatepec uh, in the former Aztec Empire, to Hernán Cortés. So obviously this um, 6th of July, 1529, this was a huge day in the life of Hernán Cortés. He's getting a new title and he's being granted lands uh, in the former Aztec Empire. And what's very interesting here is that he's not just being given these islands um, in Lake Ecatepec, he's actually being given permission to hunt. 
where there is the hunting of stag and rabbits and other kinds of amusements. And hunting isn't just, it isn't just a leisure activity uh, at this time in the 16th century. Hunting is really how nobles expressed their power uh, symbolically. Um, it was actually how they sort of expressed their dominion over the natural world, whether they were hunting with birds or dogs or by themselves with their own weapons. It's a very, very politically charged activity uh, that really defines how these noblemen, these quasi medieval Renaissance people viewed the natural world, whether it was in the New World in Mexico or back in Europe in the Old World. So I think with that, we can move on to the next one. Okay, thank you, Scott. So we're just gonna switch gears just a little bit, but still looking at an incredibly old uh, document. This is the Doctrina Breve. Uh, it's the oldest surviving book from the Americas. There are records of religious pamphlets and such, but the physical copies of those have not withstood the test of time. So the Doctrina Breve is the oldest surviving book printed in the Americas. It was printed in 1544 in Mexico City via an imported printing press from Spain. Uh, and it is written in Spanish by the first Bishop of Mexico, Juan de Zamarada. Uh, and it's sort of a doctrine of things pertaining to the Catholic faith and to Christianity uh, in plain style for common understanding. It was meant to make the ideas of Catholicism more accessible to uh, the native population, the indigenous tribes and groups of New Spain. The Spanish Empire had really only existed for in Mexico for a little over two decades before the Doctrina Breve was published, and it shows how much emphasis this the rulers of Spain put on disseminating Catholicism to the Aztecs, the Mayans, and other indigenous groups in the area. So this is a very important book in many respects, not just for its date, but also for its influence religiously. Thank you, Emily. Next slide, please. So alongside the Doctrina Breve, we have the Bay Psalm, which is the first book published in British America's colonies, now the United States. It was printed in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1640, so nearly a century after uh, the Doctrina Breve was first published. It was translated from the original Hebrew, and the idea was that psalms are meant to be sung, and they wanted to sort of create that same rhythm. Uh, it was mainly published in English for the Puritan population of Massachusetts, but later on, one of the translators of the Bay Psalm would translate it once more, and would translate the Bible into the languages of the indigenous groups in the area in an effort to spread Christianity to those native groups as well. All right, thank you, Emily. We'll go on to the next one. And keeping in the theme with translations and books and such, this is a Spanish-Japanese dictionary that was published in Manila in the Philippines in 1630, so a decade before the Bay Psalm. And it shows the extent of the Spanish colonialism and the Spanish empire as they are creating these sort of connections to different regions and languages. And this shows truly how far the Spanish empire stretched before their decline, as Alex mentioned in the with the series of revolutions that kicks off in 1810. And later on, the Spanish Empire would decline significantly in the 19th century following the Spanish-American War, which led to the loss of territories, including the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Guam, which are now American territories and were established as a result of the Spanish-American War of the 1890s. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Okay, um, so this next one we're going to look at 
is uh, another manuscript uh, written in the 17th century. And this is actually a, a document from the Spanish Inquisition, which um, was also operating um, you know, in a very big and powerful way in, in Mexico. And this document sort of compiles um, a series of testimonies in a court case, in an Inquisition trial. And the person on trial was an enslaved person uh, by the name of Jerónimo de Vergara. Uh, he's identified um, by his, his racial category of mulatto, uh, which would have meant that he was of both uh, African and probably European ancestry. Um, and it tells quite a story. Um, so Jerónimo de Vergara, we're told in the document, is accused of blasphemy uh, by the Inquisition. Um, and evidently, he, he blasphemed while his wife was essentially being, uh, and this is very disturbing, tortured to death at the hands of the masters of the um, obraje, or sort of a, a work site or a workshop where um, they were both working as enslaved people. And in the case, Jerónimo is arguing not to be returned to that work site. And somewhat surprisingly, he, he essentially wins his case. Uh, and when I say he wins his case, I don't mean that um, he's liberated from his, his state as an enslaved person. I mean that he's not going to be returned to that work site or to any relatives of his former master. So this document, it's a, it's a very good example of how uh, of the power dynamics in the colony at this time, especially when it comes to enslaved persons. Um, he was able to exercise a certain amount of agency within this system and within his very precarious state of being. Um, he was able to use the vocabulary and the reasoning of the system against itself in order to try to resist and, and um, secure his, to the best of his ability, his own safety. So it is a fascinating legal document that tells a very um, difficult but interesting story about resilience and um, within this colonial context. So with that, the next slide, please. All right, so in keeping with the broad theme of Inquisition documents, um, we also, the Rosenbach has several manuscripts and of court records from the Inquisition. Uh, one example is a 1614 case um, against an unnamed party in which the accused is um, accused of breaking the Inquisition's vows of secrecy by making a copy of the court proceedings and letting several priests and women read it. Uh, there's also a case from 1669 in which a free woman named Victoria is accused of turning an avocado into a snake. Uh, many of the cases with accusations of witchcraft or sorcery note the accused committed blasphemy, like Scott mentioned with the Jeronimo case, or renounced Christ, and emphasize the heavy Catholic influence again. And additionally, many of the people that were accused of witchcraft or sorcery were women or enslaved persons, people considered to be outside of the general citizenry and considered less than based on the social structures imposed by the Spanish after their conquest. This sort of, again, provides an insight into how ordinary people navigated the legal complexities of the Inquisition and it also, again, just sort of provides a glimpse into how they live their daily lives. And you'll see also we have a true account of the trials and examinations of witches, uh, which comes from Cotton Mather, the sort of infamous Puritan um, pastor. And when we think of witches, we often associate with New England, the Salem witch trials and all of that. But it shows that this idea was prevalent in many, many corners of the world, and the Inquisition documents from Mexico are no exception. <laughs>
Thank you, Emily. Well, thank you so much, uh, Scott and Aya, for providing us with that overview, sort of a brief introduction to the Rosenbach's holdings in this area. I'm sure those of you in the audience can gather that um, our collections hold a lot of interesting and fascinating stories connected to the history of Mexico. And what, what, what we saw today is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the full depth and breadth of our collections. And we do have two different um, finding aids and collections guides that will be of interest to you if you're curious to learn more about the holdings that we do have. One of them is the collections guide that Scott and Aya created last summer, which really focuses in on a collection of Mexican government documents, printed government documents, uh, that we at the Rosenbeck had never really cataloged before. And it was the, uh, the focus of their project to help us understand what these materials were, and um, how best we could interpret them to the public. So that is available via the Rosenbach's website. We also have a finding aid that offers a uh, deep um, dive into the manuscript material, the handwritten materials, some of which Scott and Aya shared with you. Uh, these are obviously very long URLs, so please don't feel like you have to jot these down right now. We will send them around to you via email after the event today so that you can just click and go explore them yourself. Again, we do hope that once the Rosenbach reopens, you will come to make use of our collections. Uh, our, we, we make our holdings accessible uh, during certain specified hours via our reading room when we are open to the public, and we do offer the bilingual Spanish and English Mexico race and revolution in the borderland behind the bookcase hands-on tour. If you're interested in learning more about our programs and other opportunities uh, at the Rosenbach, please do visit rosenbach.org. And we have a, a wealth of information on our website that will help you continue your exploration of our institution. Next slide, please. So thank you so much again to Aya, Scott, and Emily for uh, facilitating this event today and helping us showcase some of the materials uh, in our collection. Thanks to those of you in the audience for being here to learn about our holdings. And uh, Emily, if you'll advance to the next slide, I would like to um, open the floor for some questions and discussion. If you have any questions uh, that came up during our conversation, please do enter them into the chat box and Emily will kindly um, sort of look them over and uh, read them and help us work our way through any questions. Also, I would love uh, to pose a sort of discussion question as well, which is in what ways would it benefit residents of the United States to have a deeper understanding of the history of Mexico and other Latin American nations? If you have any thoughts as to that question, please enter them in the chat box. Take a few moments to gather your thoughts um, and share any ideas you have, and we will do our best to answer your questions. So we'll, we will hang tight while you um, enter some questions. So Susan asks, um, how was the experience of the Spanish Inquisition different in Mexico than in Spain? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just throw a few lines out there um, just to um, play around a little bit with this question. Um, it's a big question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind um, for me is actually just the exchange of knowledge between Spain and the New World. And uh, from my understanding, I believe there were much stricter restrictions on what, what books and other things could be um, sent to the New World or brought with people to the New World or, or printed in the New World. Um, so obviously the Inquisition was um, very strict within Spain and Europe in general, I should say, um, within the Catholic Europe in general. Um, and I think it was to an even greater extent in the New World. I think some of the problems I think that um, they would have tried to address um, as a legal body would have been related to um, indigenous peoples and indigenous practices and, and which ones were acceptable under the new regime. 
Um, I think another issue that probably often came up were um, missionaries that either reflected or did not reflect the interests of the Inquisition. And I do know at one point the order of the Jesuits was heavily censored by the Inquisition. So um, I, I, that's not a full answer, but I hope maybe that gives you a few, few lines to explore. Emily, I don't know if you saw that we got a question from the Q&A feature as well. Oh, I didn't see that. Thank you for pointing that out. So the question from Adam in Q&A is, are you aware of anyone from Spanish culture at the time, from political, intellectual, or religious institutions, who opposed or at least questioned the word colonial project, in quotations? Uh, I can speak to this a little bit. In terms of religious, um, opposition there were there are quite a two particular jesuit priests who come to mind uh Fray Sahagun and Bartolome de las Casas they wrote many sort of treaties and um reprimanded the spanish conquistadors for their treatment of indigenous people especially um like we know saw with the land grant that cortez received in addition to that land, he received all the people who were originally inhabiting that land and then were became sort of forced to work for Cortes or other nobles and the Jesuit priests were very, vo some of them were very vocal about Spanish mistreatment of indigenous peoples and sort of questioning that colonial project, which again, influence the sort of censuring of Jesuit priests by the Inquisition. So it kind of connects the question from Susan as well. In terms of political and intellectual uh, responses, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that there were some religious uh, oppositions. So I hope that has provided a bit of an answer to your question. So Leah um, has a thought about the discussion question that Alex posed. Um, considering how far North Spanish holdings extended into what is now the US, I think many people don't realize that a lot of Hispanic indigenous people have lived in areas like Texas since before it even became the US. Our histories are not as separate as some believe. I think that that's such a wonderful point. And, you know, I certainly feel like um, one way that presidents of the United States can benefit from having a broader perspective of uh, the history of the Americas is by helping us understand the, in what ways US history is unique and different from other, other nations, other societies, other cultures, and in what ways uh, we are integrally connected to a much larger history of imperialism, colonialism, and sort of the different streams that things like um, ethnicity, uh, relationships with indigenous peoples, political structures, uh, cultural expectations took. I think um, that sort of perspective can be very valuable. And all too often uh, in the US, we, we don't necessarily have a solid understanding of how we fit into that broader picture. I think that artifacts like what we hold at the Rosenbach offer a really useful comparison uh, that can help us sort of decenter um, our understandings of our own national history in a powerful way. So Jean asks um, if we know of any books or documents that provide more information about the Jesuits um, that A was just talking about who were at odds with the Spanish colonial regime. I don't know any off the top of my head, but uh, the things written by Sahagun and Bartolome Las Casas are easily available through the internet because the sort of they were written in the 1500s, so they have been 
we published many times um, in terms of more academic reading. This area is not necessary, is not my area of focus, so I can't speak to um, that, but maybe Scott, you have some more concrete references. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, as for like the Jesuits specifically, if you want to see uh, actually like a cinematic representation of this issue, um, uh, a good way to start could be the, the film The Mission, with, uh, which actually stars Robert De Niro and, and several other big actors. And it's about a Jesuit mission um, in, I believe, Paraguay or on the border of Paraguay and, and Brazil and how the Jesuits were actually sort of caught in the middle um, of, their, of their mission of uh, preaching to the indigenous peoples and um, the imperial authority, which were far less tolerant and took a more hard mind violent approach towards the indigenous people. So obviously that's not an academic work, um, but it, it could be a jumping off point to uh, explore the issue a little more. And Susan is interested uh, in both Ed Scott's um, areas of study and um, how have they used the, ho the, the holdings of the Rosenbach in their own academic work. Uh, well, as I said, this is my area of um, focus is Cold War Latin America, uh, but the sort of um, political and social um, hierarchies that were established by Spanish conquest heavily in influenced societal organization and ideas about sort of racial superiority and how, which groups deserve citizenry, which groups needed more help to become more developed and sort of follow the Republican ideals of um, society and unfortunately due to you know the pandemic I haven't been able to really take as much advantage as I would like of these holdings um, but I am interested in exploring the relationships between how the Spanish Empire and the United States had both similar and different approaches to defining race that's where I um, fall into this. Sorry there, I think I had a little connection issue, but um, now it seems to be working. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, actually, my main area of interest is actually in the Middle Ages, and especially Spain and the Iberian Peninsula in the Middle Ages. Um, but my interest has sort of crept up, you know, through the centuries a little bit and, and crossed over to Latin America in interesting ways. Um, sort of as we saw today, there's um, a lot of the medieval world actually sort of gets transposed into Latin America through, through the Catholic Church, through practices like uh, manuscripts and the, and the printing of books. I, I'm also very interested in uh, texts, like material texts themselves, um, like some of the ones we've seen today. So yeah, I would say mostly I'm in the Spanish Middle Ages, um, but that interest really brings me back and forth to Latin America in a, in a lot of interesting ways. Great. So it looks like I, um, I think that we've answered all the questions posed by the audience. Um, so again, thank you so much for participating. Oh, I spoke too soon. Adam has one more thought. Um, he says it's a little tangential, um, but he wants to recommend um, John Leguizamo, oh, I just butchered that last name, uh, Latin History for Morons. Um, so wants to recommend that as a, as a possible resource for people. Okay, so again, thanks so much for participating today.
Um, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Uh, and I uh, hope we see you soon, um, either online um, or in person at the Rosenbach when we open back up. And as Alex said, um, you will be receiving a follow-up email uh, with some additional resources um, that you can use uh, to continue your exploration of this topic. So thanks again and have a wonderful weekend, everyone.